Hello and welcome back to another watercolor bird tutorial. I'm really excited about this next one. We'll be painting a hummingbird. If you've been following along with this series already, we've painted a tufted titmouse, a cardinal, and a Baltimore oriole. I've decided to rearrange the location of my hummingbird. You might be wondering why I'm changing the order. Well, it has to do with the direction of the bird's tails. So when I laid these out, there was something that was just bothering me about it. And I think it's because with the birds in the corners, their tails are actually pointing to the corners, except for the hummingbird. So what I think I'm going to do is take the hummingbird and move him up to where the robin goes. So we'll be putting the hummingbird right here in our painting. Here's a little thumbnail sketch that I did with the rearranged robin in the bottom corner and the hummingbird in the middle. And I think that looks a lot better just because of the direction their tails are pointing. There is another reason too for rearranging them. With the bright color of the Baltimore Oriole, the bright orange belly, I thought that we could balance it out by putting the red bellied robin down here in the corner. Again, for the sake of harmony and balance. If you've already sketched on all nine of your birds, don't worry about rearranging them again. This was just my personal choice at the last minute. Supplies you'll need for today's project include paper towel for blotting and controlling how much water's in your brush. I'm gonna be using a small size four silver black velvet round brush. It works really well for all those little details and you can also use the belly side of the brush for broader brush strokes. Make sure you have a water jar or two, a pencil for doing your sketch, and your watercolor paints. Today I'll be using my Daniel Smith Transparent Brown Oxide, Hooker's Green, and a little bit of my yellow for some of those beautiful little shiny green feathers in the hummingbird. I'll be using Daniel Smith Indigo. And then for hinting at the beautiful red flower that you see in the reference photo, which we'll draw in really loosely and impressionistically, I'll be using my Permanent Alizarin Crimson by Holbein. For the initial sketch, I'm gonna use this as a guide for just the size of the hummingbird, but I'll be drawing with more detail. Make sure to have your reference photo on a screen in front of you or print it out so that you can easily use that as your guide. So I'm gonna place my reference sketch right up here in front of me and I want to make sure that my bird is right about in the middle so I still have room for my robin down here. I'm going to start by sketching the general angle of the bird's body and looking at the shape, that the sideways V shape that's made by the tail feathers and the wing coming up. This is just a loose and rough sketch for now. We can always tighten up these details later. The head is reaching forward. There's so much action and movement in this photo. I want to try to capture that strained look of the hummingbird just reaching for the nectar and then the little bulge of the belly where the feet are tucked under looks like that. The hummingbird is probably going to be the smallest bird. It's the smallest bird of all these birds that I'm drawing but it's not going to be lifelike in its proportions compared to the other birds but I do want it to look a little bit smaller so it doesn't look like this giant hummingbird. <laughs> and as far as the flowers go I want to be careful that I don't sketch them too far in the center because here in the middle of my composition I'll be putting the goldfinch later and so there might be a little bit of overlap but I don't want there to be too much. So with that initial sketch I'm going to go ahead and start tightening everything up. We're going to start with the tail feathers down here and I'm realizing I need to shorten the length of that a little bit. So I'm going to bring the wing slightly out further like this and just kind of lowering the whole thing. My placement was just a little off. I'm trying to keep in mind where my goldfinch is going to go in the center. If you're doing this painting as a standalone, obviously it doesn't matter as much where the placement of your hummingbird goes on your paper. It can pretty much just go in the middle or wherever you want it. But when you're doing something as a set and you're sketching everything out together, you do need to plan ahead for the location of everything. I did make a video talking about how I plan for this painting, so you guys can check that out if you wanna watch that. All right, so there's a dark shadow right here. I'm looking at how far it is from the corner of the wing here to the neck and placing it right there. And then you see the throat coming forward. The hummingbird's beak isn't really visible, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of make that up. I want it to be visible in this painting and then erase my excess markings and do a couple little sprigs of this flower, little petals coming out, nothing too detailed. This isn't a flower painting, it is a bird painting. So let's focus on that. And then for the wings, you can just go ahead and do a couple little lines coming towards the tops of the wings. Doesn't have to be an exact copy of what you're seeing. We just wanna get the essence not going for Audubon realism here. And then I made the head just a little too long, so I'm gonna 
bring that back. I'm looking at the dip, the shape of this where it comes up before it curves back over and around. And I realized I elongated the neck too much compared to where the wing is. So make those little corrections. It's best to do it now before you start painting because you can erase. And then when you begin sketching some of the details of the head, just include where maybe the feathers change colors because those are going to be important things to take note of and paint, include with your painting. Another thing to include would be any lost and found edges you might want to do all around the composition. I'm going to draw the eye and there's a little curve that comes over along the back of the eye, connects to the beak. Like that. And then the spots on the throat, you can pretty much just do those with paint. So where could we put some lost edges? For this one, I like to look in the reference photo at any areas that are lighter in value around the edges. And right here, where the white feathers are against the background, we can do a lost edge right there. We could also do a lost edge along the top of the neck. And that would be a nice balancing point. And we can make these wings disappear into the background if we use wet and wet. So that's something we can try. Maybe the tops of the wings right there. Okay, so I think we're ready to start painting. Go ahead and grab your brush, your paper towel. Now to protect the other paintings, I'm gonna cover them with paper towel just to keep those from getting spattered or accidentally dropping water and paint on those. Again, I'm going to do the same thing along here and then I'll go ahead and pull my palette in closer for easier access. All right, so to start with, we're going to do the wet and wet technique to create the soft edges on the wings. For that, we're going to need to paint with clean water inside of the wings. Why don't we just isolate it to the wings for now to keep it simple and extend the water a little beyond the wings. So I'm painting even beyond the tips of the wings because I want to encourage some of the paint, some of the water and paint to flow into those areas, causing a soft looking effect. All right, so now let's take some indigo or Payne's gray if that's what you have. Mix in a little bit of brown to neutralize it so I have this nice dark gray in my brush. And I'm gonna start at the bottom of the wing just to kind of test out the wetness and remove some on the paper towel if it's too wet. So we're just going to paint in with this light gray the wings. A little more dark paint where you see darker values in the reference photo, like at the base of the wings for example. You could use even pure indigo right here. Hopefully you stayed within your lines with your water. You don't want that paint necessarily to bleed into the background. But you can see how when you paint on the wet paper, it just flows and extends. Wherever the paper is wet, the paint will flow. So to encourage that softening effect, I'm rinsing out most of the paint. And I'm just going to kind of pull what little is left on my brush and some of the paint that's on the paper towards that wet paper, very gently feathering, with the idea of causing it to blur into the white of the paper so that it looks like it's moving. If your water was dirty, it's going to leave a ring, and I can see that mine was just a little bit tinted, so it's leaving a slight ring there. You can always re-wet that and scrub it out with pure clean water if that happens. Now we can move to the bird's body, once again using wet and wet. I see some beautiful browns, and I'm going to paint that in with water first, just like we did with the wings, but avoiding some of the pure white areas of feathers, such as on the underside of the belly right here. So I'm going to paint up to the wings and along the top of the back. Those tail feathers. Pull the water up over the top of the head, avoiding the eye and the throat for now. So hopefully you have a glossy, damp surface wherever you're going to be painting your brown. Then I'm going to take transparent brown oxide. I want it to be a pretty pure color, so if it's been touched by the blue a little bit, make sure that it's more of the pure brown rather than any blue mixed in. Remove any excess water on your paper towel before going into your painting. And then I'm applying a little bit of that to the wings and some more pure color. Ooh, that's dark. 
I'm actually going to switch to burnt sienna. I think I need something a little more orangey brown. So let's try that as we move into the body. Yes, I think that's a perfect color. And I'm using a gentle scrubbing motion. My brush is not covering everything, leaving tiny little gaps to show some of the feather texture. We'll paint the underside of the tail feathers. And along the top of the tail. And here along the top of the head. Pretty much pure burnt sienna now. If a color doesn't work for you, switch colors. The transparent brown oxide was just a little too chocolatey brown. Although I think it'll be perfect here along the beak. So I'm going to switch to that as I approach the beak. Sometimes, unless you do a study ahead of time, which you should do, I did not, but if you plan ahead your colors, that'll really help you know what's going to work and what's not. You can do, do little thumbnail sketches ahead of time to test out your colors. I'm going to dip into my orange. This is transparent orange. I've been using it for the spatter on the other birds and I used it for the belly of my Baltimore Oriole and I'm going to paint that over the top of the burnt sienna really reinforcing the orangey tint in those brown feathers. Okay, rinse that out and grab a little of my gray that I mixed up previously with indigo and I'm just going to paint the underside of the belly where we see that shadow that's cast by his body even darker where there's this dark shadow here right next to the throat. You can basically outline the head here if you're painting the shadow as you see it in the reference photo. Now we're going to slow down and really paint the details like the eye. I'm taking pure indigo or of course you can use black or Payne's gray. I want to be able to rest my hand on the paper so I'm going to dip in the water to really get the paint flowing for me. If it's catching on the surface of the paper, all you need to do is just dip it gently in the water without removing the paint and that will help it flow better. And there we have the eye. You have to be very delicate, cautious, and slow when you're painting tiny details like this. Really take your time. Now for the little markings on the top of the head, I'm going to switch to green, mix that in with my brush. And I'm going to squint at my photo and then just use the tip of the brush to paint little blobbing shapes on the top of the head. So it gives the appearance of complexity without actually taking a whole lot of work. I love it when I can create little shortcuts to what looks like detail without really having to work too hard at it. And while that green is on my brush, I can apply it to the hummingbird's back. And then I'm going to mix in a little bit of yellow with that green so that I have more of a vibrant spring green. I have Hansa Yellow Light on my palette. It's a primary yellow. And when you mix it with the green, you get this spring green color. And we'll drop that in and paint. I think I need it to be even lighter. A couple of these little feathers that are green. Shimmery green on the hummingbird so pretty. We want that color there. It's just adding so much beauty to the painting. So don't shy away from those colorful details. All right, let's dip back into our indigo again. And you can mix it with your brown for more of a dark gray and paint some of the details of the feathers. Just like you sketched on, paint the separation of the feathers with a dark color and a small brush. You can paint along the top side of the wing. Just avoid the area that you worked so hard to create a soft edge. Try to leave that really soft. So it's just here closer towards the body where you're going to see less movement in the wings. And so you can paint with more detail and more focus. But I think with our wet and wet, we were able to achieve the look of motion in the wings. Pretty happy with that.
And so I'm just following the movement of the wings, painting these separations in the feathers. Rinsing a little of that out. I think it looks like they're moving. That's so fun. All right, with a little bit of my light wash of indigo, let's come back to the head again. I'm always kind of jumping around, just painting whatever catches my eye. There's no right or wrong order to paint your bird in. Paint whatever catches your eye. That'll, it'll all come together in the end, right? So I have a super light tinted wash of gray on my brush and I'm just reinforcing the shadow tone under the belly. Now I'm gonna mix in a little more of my brown again and paint some of these little spots on the face. You can do a broad sweeping motion of the brush first to lay down a bed of color like that. And then take maybe your dark green or your Payne's gray or indigo and just do a couple little dots where the head separates from the shoulder, sort of, or the neck. We want to reinforce that line without actually drawing a line, and that's what these dots are doing. They're adding detail and also helping it, helping us be able to see that separation a little better. The neck stretching out and straining. And then you can paint some of these dots on the throat using a dark gray or brown. I'm not super concerned with perfect color matches in my paintings. More important to me is getting the pose, the essence of the movement, and of course the values right. When you have proper lights and darks, it doesn't matter what colors you use, it will still look real. So to me that's the most important element is, for realism anyway, is getting the values correct. Okay, so there we've got pretty much everything we need on our bird done. We'll, we'll need to do the flower next so our little hummingbird isn't just flailing around without any food. I'm going to add a little bit more indigo on the underside of the belly so we can see a stronger shadow there to really help it pop forward. And same with the tail feathers here. Let's darken those up just a little. on the wings too if you want to add one more layer of dark color this is your chance to really reinforce those values make it pop forward and really stand out yes I think that last layer helped a lot let me add just a couple suggestions of feet right here a little gray mark for the foot okay for the flower, I'm going to take my permanent alizarin crimson with a little bit of water so it's nice juicy paint on my brush. And we're not going to do complete flower, I'm just going to do a suggestion of flowers. So I'm taking the tip of my brush and pulling towards myself in this down stroke almost, but sideways. And then I'm allowing my brush to catch on the surface of the paper, picking up on that texture of the cold pressed paper. And then if you want, you can take a little of your green and maybe suggest the base of the flower over here. Unlike the other birds in this series, the hummingbird is not sitting on a branch. So he's alone in that feature. Let's see how he looks with the rest of the birds. Quite nicely balanced, I think. So the last thing will be to add a little bit of spatter to help him match the birds around him. I'm gonna take my transparent orange with lots of water lots of water in my brush so I dip in the water one more time and then I'm just going to gently tap with two fingers over the hummingbird avoiding the body we don't want to paint over the top of the bird necessarily you can paint over the top of the flower if it's still wet it will soften out a little bit which looks really cool and it doesn't need a whole lot for it to look whimsical and so fun Okay, and then I'm going to add a couple more of those manual circles, just giving it more of a balanced, finished, polished look. Do one over the top of the flower. 
If like me, your water left a little bit of a stain, don't freak out, we can actually fix that. What you do need is pure clean water and a pure clean brush. In fact, I'm gonna take a brand new brush just so I know that there's no paint in there. Soak it in the water for a second and then apply some of that water to where that stain line is. Removing any excess. And then I'm just gonna gently scrub to help spread and soften out that stain line. And you can see that that has helped it disappear. We'll know once it's dried if we were really successful with that, but I think that looks a lot better. Once it's dry, you can erase any of your extra pencil lines, like the ones around the head and the body maybe that you don't want. But there we go. I really hope you were able to follow along with this hummingbird tutorial. I had so much fun painting it, and I hope you'll join me for the rest of this series. We still have five more birds to paint, so stay tuned and keep painting with me. Please hit that like button if you enjoyed this video and learned something from it. it. Helps me out as a creator to be able to continue bringing you free videos like this. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon.